Amen, Mike. So we are live. We are we on. Be good. Yep. We are on. Amen. 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 So we are live again with Dr. Corey talking about the Feast of Yahweh. Um, how are you doing today, Mike? Doing good. Excited to be here, particularly after our uh, conversation that we had earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, <clears throat> I know some of the folks will, they eventually connect, but um, there is a lot uh, of amazing feedback that I've been receiving. You know, some people actually watch this later on. Yeah. And we send it, we send it over to, you know, the other, other, every folks that basically they they ask for material in English and it's gone all the way to Europe, <laughs> believe it nice. or not. So, um, you know, and, and the, I think it's fascinating everything that you've been blessing us with and the teachings. And, you know, one of the things that I want to share, not specifically with Mike, but with you guys out there is our desire is to go after the heart of God. Obviously, we know we're not going to have every single answer. But as the Lord gives us resources, right, and ways for us to be able to get as close to the truth as possible, we will do our best to do that and change accordingly. You know, if today we teach something, but the Lord teaches us, and says, hey, you know what, Gio, you know what, Mike, it's not like that. It's like this. Well, we are obligated, obviously, to make the change as he shows us. So it is important that, that um, you know, we are constantly open to that. The Lord is the one that is going to guide us through this. So, Mike, I'll start off with a prayer. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you for everything you do, everything you give us, for allowing us this moment to be alive, for giving us the gift of life specifically in these times. These are times where many of the prophets, to include your son Abraham, wish they would have been born to see all the fulfillments of all the things that you have fulfilled to the team and the things that you continue to do now through your people, through us. So Heavenly Father, we praise you and we ask that you continue to give us revelation, understanding, humbleness, meekness, and just a, a, a true spirit, genuine of love after you with the desire to do your will and on your will. We pray this in your name, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 So we, we have Paul, Mariana, and B. Taylor. They're connected. Shalom, shalom. Good evening. So Mike, I will make you host. And I know you probably would like to share. Yep, I'll do that in just a second. All right, we ready? We are ready. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, what's today? Tuesday, May the 10th, 2022. And excited because we're going over the feast of Yahweh, the feast of the Lord. And we're talking about um, how they are rehearsals for the first and the second coming of Yeshua to the planet. And if you've missed a couple of the past episodes, I um, encourage you to go back and uh, watch those. Because as we go through this in the course of this year, um, it's, it's difficult to come in in the middle and catch up sometimes and understand what we're talking about because every episode builds on the previous episode upon the previous episode. So um, we build that foundation of knowledge and understanding as we're going through and it leads us into the next week and the next time of learning. And um, so just want to encourage you to do that. Take the time to do that in case you get lost somewhere. You will probably get your questions answered in the previous episodes. So tonight, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You guys see that? Right yes, there? sir. Right. Yes. Yeah. Super. Let's put that up. 
put on my chat. So if anybody has a question, put it in the chat. We'll get to it. We'll try to get to you uh, and see what's going on. So last, uh, let me back up just a second here. So we are going through Yeshua's final spring feast season. And what we have on our calendar over here uh, is a calendar illustration of what some scholars, uh, including, including me, I agree with it as well, um, was the actual timing of events in uh, Yeshua's Passion Week, which was the week of the Passover where he was crucified. Um, so that would have been uh, his last spring feast season on the earth. Um, and so we're covering that. I've put it here in a calendar format to understand it. We have uh, basic calendar months here, these three columns. And then we've broken out the days and the weeks, as you can see here, we've broken them out into the Jewish calendar here where sunset and these rectangles is marking about 6 p.m. and it's in the middle of this day Sunday and this day Monday and Tuesday and so on and so we've marked all the events <clears throat> of the feast of the Moedim and then we're going through the gospels the gospel accounts of what happened to Yeshua uh, in his last uh, passion week in his last season of spring holidays that he fulfilled the rehearsals and so we're, we're going through, uh, we're going to publish this. Uh, I think we missed it last week. We're going to publish some of this if we haven't already on the website or on uh, Telegram. And you can get it and look at it because um, it really requires quite a bit of time to go through this and really get it into your brain. Because it's, diff it's a different way sometimes of thinking of some of the events. And I have found it, and as I've taught this over the years, other people have found it um, easier to understand events and what we're talking about from a chronological, real-time sequence. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here, because that's what we live in day-to-day, -day, right? That's what we can relate to most easily. And so I've tried to recreate that here for us to look at on a calendar basis as we go through the detail over here. Um, it's a lot of material, so you can get lost in it. So you can come out of studying the material, or you can print this out, print two copies, and you look at the calendar while you're reading the material, and you can just kind of get it in your brain of what happened when. So we have gone through the rehearsals in Yeshua's fulfillment of taking this one month here when everything happens in the spring feast. And we're talking about what happened on those days. And so we've talked about preparation for Passover, which on the calendar is marked by EP right here. And so here we're talking about the rehearsals and the fulfillments that Yeshua had that we read about in the Gospels and how he fulfilled those in fulfilling the rehearsal here and the commandment for the rehearsal here. So when you're looking at this um we're looking at this my presentation here's the commandment for the rehearsal for the holiday here's traditionally how they did it here and then here's yeshua's fulfillment here's the scriptures that we're getting our information from um, there might be a few extra scriptures that you could put in here but we abbreviated some of them just for simplicity's sake for the presentation so we went through last week preparation for Passover. Here, when Yeshua came into Jerusalem, we went through Arab Passover, which was all of the events that happened in this 24-hour period marked on the calendar. But it's quite a bit of information. So we went through multiple pages last week. Just quickly on the calendar, we'll talk about uh, this day, EP, which is the 14th of Nisan. And we talked about the Last Supper, that Yeshua would have had the Last Supper on the night before the actual Passover meal. So there's a debate uh, about that. Did Yeshua eat the Passover with his disciples or did he eat a separate meal? And we maintain that he ate uh, a separate meal with his disciples. And as such, when the lambs were crucified here, 
on this day of the 14th, he was hanging on the cross at the same time. And so the sacrifice of the Passover lambs was the rehearsal for Yeshua's fulfillment, hanging on the cross as the Passover lamb. So that gets us to um, a consistent understanding of the feast as rehearsals themselves for what was going to happen to Yeshua. And so Yeshua's events don't have to, uh, how do I say this correctly? The events of the holiday were to understand what was going to happen to Yeshua. And so that's how we understand it. And you can go back and forth between them to map them and connect the dots, which is what we do. We try not to force anything. We just try to let the Bible speak for itself and understand how and when the spring feasts were celebrated, what they did on certain days, what were the hours of the day when they did certain things. And we try to connect it to what happened to Yeshua. And the the gospel accounts do give us uh, some detail on that, fortunately. And um, so we can connect some of those dots with um, conclusive evidence um, that what we've constructed here has um, a great degree of credibility and accuracy. So that's what we're trying to get to. And we were certainly, like Gio said, open to changing and being corrected. Um, And I've taught this for about 10 years now. So um, made some corrections along the that journey um, and think what I have here is fairly accurate, if not accurate, and um, but open to correction. So um, that's where we are. And so going back to what happened on the 14th, MX is Messiah being crucified while they're sacrificing the lambs on uh, the Temple Mount. Then we talked about uh, BM, BM here on the calendar. BM is when they marked the barley. And they marked the barley uh, on the Mount of Olives. There was uh, barley crops planted every year. And so they would mark the barley um, by marching over the priests, the Sanhedrin, thousands of people in Jerusalem for the Passover that week um, would all march over. So this was a very public event. Um, Imagine like the Macy's Day Parade, something like that marching over to the Mount of Olives, going to, um, I'm sure they had a spot picked out for it, but going to some of the ripened barley, and they would wrap a a cord around it or a ribbon around it to mark it for um, what was going to be harvested three days later for the Feast of First Fruits um, wave offering of bread. So they used this barley they marked, to harvest it here, to prepare it here, and to make the offering on this morning of first fruits. So it's tied together. It's very important to realize that that it's a couple of events that, tied, that are tied together, but there's three days in between those events. And then we talked about the high priest seclusion, and the high priest seclusion marked by HPS on our calendar was. Um, a tradition that I've heard taught. I have yet to find the actual resource that contains that in Judaism, like somewhere in the Mishnah or uh, some of their other texts um, that gives the document and the source for this. I'm still looking for it. Um, But the tradition was that the high priest, just before sunset here, and the day transitions from the 14th to the 15th, the high priest would seclude himself inside of the temple um, to be ceremonially clean up until the time of first fruits, which is when they would have prepared the first fruits offering and he would have presented it that morning as a wave offering before the Lord. And then he was able to come out of seclusion. So he was released from his seclusion, uh, which is marked here on our calendar by HPR, which is high priest's release. Um, and we talked about that as a rehearsal for uh, Yeshua. So that's where we left off last week. And I'm going to go back to that page where we left off. And we're going to talk about that because it could be a little bit 
confusing with one of the verses that we were looking at, and it was here. Talking about the marking of the first fruits barley, which on our calendar is here. We talked about that. And so think about this in real time. They're going over to the Mount of Olives, and it's about five o'clock, six o'clock. The sun is going down. And so you've got thousands of people marching over to the Mount of Olives in their uh, Macy's Day type parade. And they're marking the barley. And so you've got the priests, the Sanhedrin, you've got thousands and thousands of just normal people who want to be a part of witnessing this event, marching over from the city gates of Jerusalem over to the Mount of Olives, and they're lining up the road, they're up the mountain, it was probably very crowded, it was a very public event, which was open to anybody who cared to be there, so that's what's going on here when they're marking the barley, and so Let's talk about Yeshua's fulfillment of that part of the rehearsal. Matthew records that the graves of the righteous dead are opening and appearing to many. Here's the verse. But what we need to understand as we look at these three verses in Matthew 27, verses 51 to 53, we can read that and easily think that all happened at the same time. We don't have the Jewish context for those events. I mean, they're mostly lost unless you look it up in a book, which um, the book is called The Temple by Alfred Edersheim. I don't have the resource on this presentation, but that's it if you want to look it up. Um, and he talks about what happened. And they're over there marking the barley because, as I explained earlier, they would harvest that barley three days later. And so we look at what Matthew wrote here in chapter 27 verses 51 through 53 and we have to understand that not all of matthew's account happens at the same time let's talk about it so as the priests are marking the barley of the first fruits of the agricultural harvest god marks the tombs of the righteous dead by breaking them open but this is our presumption that apparently the righteous dead don't come to life yet so right here, which is a Wednesday afternoon about sunset, the graves break open. The graves are marked by God, being broken open the same time that they're marking the barley. And so what happens next? We look at well, what did they do after they marked the barley? Well, they didn't do anything. They waited three days until you got here which was on the Feast of first fruits, and then they marched back over and harvested the barley. And so we look at Matthew's account, and in his account in those three scriptures, it says that the tombs are marked, and then it says that the righteous dead appeared to many. And so we would think oh, that all happened at the same time. But our premise and our thesis and what we're going to maintain is that, no, those events did not happen at the same time. There were three days difference between them. How do we know there's three days difference between the righteous dead tombs being marked and then them coming to life and appearing to many in Jerusalem? We know, or we think that it's, we maintain there's three days because that was how they celebrated the uh, first fruits feast. That's how they marked the barley and they harvested it for the feast. And so we have to look back at what they did. Like, how did they do that? to make sense of what happened in Matthew's account in the gospel. So that doesn't make sense to you guys. Give me a little shout on the chat. So just as the priests were marking the barley of the first fruits of the harvest on the Mount of Olives, God marks the tombs of the righteous dead by breaking them open. But apparently the righteous dead don't come to life and appear to many until after Yeshua's resurrection, which Matthew asserts. He doesn't necessarily say that, but we assume that's what he meant. And so only the first part of Matthew 27:52 occurs now. The remainder of the verses of 52 and verse 53 occurred three days later here, just after sunset. 
And so here's the verse in Matthew. He says the tombs broke open. So that would have happened here. So let's keep going. We talked about the high priest seclusion, which would have happened about sundown, just before sundown. And that is just before they put Yeshua in the tomb. So at the time when the high priest was about to go into seclusion, that's when here Joseph of Arimathea got permission from Pilate to bury Yeshua's body in an unused tomb. And so what Joseph did by burying Jesus fulfilled the rehearsal of the high priest seclusion. And he buried the high priest in the ground as the Jewish high priest that year secluded himself in the temple. Here's the scripture. I'm not going to read that because we went through that last week. So I want to pick up here. Is everybody with me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. You guys are picking this up quicker than I thought. This is, uh, you guys are doing great. Um, this is super. We're going to fly through this stuff. So let's get to the unleavened bread. So as the day transitions from the 14th to the 15th, and we're eating the Passover meal, now we start the first day of unleavened bread, right? This is where the bread of affliction becomes the bread of life. And so the rehearsal, starting with the first Passover in Egypt and continuing for centuries, Israel was commanded to eat the bread without yeast for the seven days of unleavened bread. And so the bread, which symbolized their affliction in Egypt and their quick departure from Egypt, became the food that sustained them until God began to supernaturally provide manna for them in the desert, right? Ancient Israel departed Egypt um, on the first day of the feast, which was a Sabbath, right? Because the first day of unleavened bread is, is a high Sabbath. And so the fulfillment in Yeshua, as the Passover bread of affliction, after his crucifixion on the Passover, he became the bread of life for his people. So just, so just like I'm making the, uh, the comparison here of uh, the affliction, um, the bread of affliction, the matzah that the Israelites were commanded to eat, that they would have ate for the seven days coming out of Egypt until manna started to fall. That is just like Yeshua, because he was the Passover bread of affliction for his people, and he became the bread of life, just like the manna became the bread of life later for God's people. And so that's what he said. He said, He declared, I am the bread of life. And so he was telling them giving them, I think, a hint or a clue that we can go back and look at this 2,000 years later and put these things together and understand them with some clarity. And he talked about it. And he's talking about your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread talking about himself that came down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. This bread is my flesh which I'll give for the life of the world. And so he inserts himself in there as a fulfillment of, uh, of that rehearsal. So let's keep going. Now we're in unleavened bread. So we're going to go through the next seven days on our calendar here and talk about what happened. So here we are. Let's talk about the Feast of First Fruits, which... We maintain, and we've talked about, there's a little bit of a debate in, um, among scholars and theologians on when the Feast of First Fruits uh, was celebrated. Was it the day after the weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread, or was it the day after the high Sabbath, of the, the first high Sabbath of unleavened bread? And so we maintain that it was the uh, first fruits occurred on the day after the weekly Sabbath. During the week of unleavened bread, it's a lot to keep up with, isn't it? And the reason, the main reason that I maintain that, um, and I think some other scholars do the same, <clears throat> is because if you do it that way, then the way that the feasts were commanded to be celebrated and the way that the tradition went of what they did, you can fit it exactly to what happened to Yeshua, and it, it fits. And so we're, we're trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle. And just like when you put together a jigsaw puzzle, you can find, hey, maybe this fits here and that fits there. And you try it out 
and it doesn't necessarily do that. So you got to try something different. And so we're cutting and pasting parts of the jigsaw puzzle until we get it together to where it fits and the way this way they all fit together. The timing, which becomes apparent after we get through Shavuot, which hopefully we're going to get through that tonight. So let's talk about the Feast of First Fruits. It's a one day feast that occurs on the day following the weekly Sabbath during the week of unleavened bread. The date and the day of first fruits can change each year. Because remember, God, you count the feast of first fruits on a day that follows the weekly Sabbath. You don't know when that's going to occur. You don't know the date of that ahead of time. So it just falls where it falls on the calendar during the month. And so that's how you count it. So let's talk about the rehearsal. As the sun sets, completing the weekly Sabbath and starting the beginning of the day of the Feast of First Fruits, the priests and the elders and the large crowd of onlookers, that's our Macy's Day parade, would be gathered on the Mount of Olives to harvest the first sheaves of ripened barley that were marked three days prior on Nisan 14th, which was Passover preparation day. So this harvest would be the first fruits of the barley harvest that year. So this is the very first harvest of any of the crops in Israel that year. And it occurred here, just after sunset, ending the weekly Sabbath, starting the Feast of First Fruits. This is when they harvested the barley. I've mentioned it a couple of times. That was marked three days prior back here. BM, barley marked. And so this is the fulfillment As the priests were harvesting the barley, the graves of the righteous dead were opened on the Mount of Olives and the first fruits of humanity's resurrection came forth, which Matthew states in chapter 27, verse the end of verse 52 through 53. It says, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, talking about Yeshua's resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Hopefully here you can see why it's important to have a calendar and put these events on the calendar so you can think about what happened on a day. You can compare the days, but we also need to think about what happened on certain hours of the day to be able to put it all together. And so look at Matthew's verse here. He says that many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised from the dead and coming out of the graves after Yeshua's resurrection. So if they came out of the graves here, this is Saturday night. Here's Saturday right there. If they come out of the graves here on Saturday evening, oops, at the same time that they were harvesting the barley, then they appeared to many in Jerusalem Saturday night. But if that didn't happen until after Yeshua's resurrection, then when was Yeshua resurrected? It wasn't Sunday, because we're still on Saturday. Yeshua had to have been resurrected sometime this Saturday, right? We don't know exactly when, but Just wrapping your brain around that would throw you for a loop a little bit to think about, hey, Yeshua might have been resurrected on Saturday. Well, according to the Hebraic rendition and and what we're looking at here, he was resurrected on Saturday. I think he was resurrected on the Shabbat. Because humanity had nothing to do with his resurrection. So while humanity was completely at rest, God worked and resurrected his son. And so he came to life here which is a little bit to wrap your brain around. But we do maintain, and I will maintain, um, I will put my money on it, that because Matthew said the righteous dead were appearing to many here on Saturday, doesn't say Saturday, but we assume that it was because that's when they harvested the barley. Sometime prior to The righteous dead of resurrecting and appearing to many, Yeshua was was resurrected, which had to have happened in that sequence because Yeshua is the first fruits of humanity's resurrection. Doesn't make sense that people were resurrected before he was. 
So we're going to maintain somehow here on Saturday, Yeshua was resurrected and that the righteous dead, like Matthew was saying here, came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. What do you guys think about that? Kind of crazy, huh? All right, let's keep going. So we're here Saturday night. We got Yeshua resurrected. We've got the weekly Sabbath is over. We have first fruits of humanity's resurrection appearing to many in Jerusalem. And we have the marked barley from here harvested here after sundown is what Alfred Edersheim says in his book, and they will march back over from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem to the temple to take that harvested barley into the Temple Mount, and they will make it into grain for the first fruits wave offering, which is going to occur on Sunday morning. So let's get to that. Let's talk about the high priest presentation of the first fruits to the Lord. Here's the rehearsal. And we're right here on the calendar. This is going to be going on in the early morning hours of Sunday. I don't know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., maybe all night. Maybe they didn't go to sleep that night. All through the night, the grain from the barley sheaves is threshed and roasted, then ground into flour, made into special fruits offerings which include a year-old lamb without defect. On the morning of the feast, which is Sunday morning, the high priest would wave the first fruits offering before God as a thanksgiving offering for the beginning of the grain harvest. After that, the high priest could come out of, of, uh, out of seclusion. Excuse me. And we're right here, early Sunday morning. Yeshua's fulfillment. Apparently, Yeshua needed to ascend into heaven on the morning of this feast to present himself and, assuming, the first fruits of the righteous dead who were walking around in Jerusalem the night before, to the Father in the heavenly temple, because when Yeshua told Mary, touch me not, for I have yet to ascend to the Father, he needed to remain secluded until he had done so. For it was after that that when Yeshua began to appear to the disciples and interact with them. So think about that for a minute. High priest is here. It's Sunday morning. It's early Sunday morning. The high priest is in the temple. They are finishing preparing the wave offering. He's going to be preparing the wave offering in the temple to the Lord in the holy place. And at the same time, Mary has gone out to the tomb of Yeshua, finds it rolled open, and the tomb is empty. She's weeping because they think that they stole her body, right? And then the angel appears and says, paraphrase, um, here it is. Let's go to the verse. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Yeshua had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Yeshua standing there and did not know that it was him. And Yeshua said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, Tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And then Yeshua said to Mary, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbi. And Yeshua said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But I go to my brethren. But no, you, Mary, go to my brethren, excuse me, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. So Yeshua, the heavenly high priest, 
offered himself as the first fruits of the resurrection to God, along with the first fruits of humanity's resurrected dead. This would mark the beginning of Israel and the nations receiving God's promise from Genesis 3.15 to send a redeemer to redeem humanity from sin and death. This promise in Genesis 3.15 occurred 4,000 years before Yeshua fulfilled it and went to heaven and took himself in the first fruits of humanity's resurrection. So he fulfilled the 4,000 year old prophecy when he did this. Pretty cool. And Paul asserted the very same thing. He says, first Corinthians, but Christ has risen indeed been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. So if we put it together that way, everything fits. Takes a minute to digest that. So here we are on our calendar. We're going to finish unleavened bread here. And now this is when Yeshua begins to appear to his disciples. So in our calendar, I've shaded these days in gray. This is when he would have uh, begun to appear uh, to the disciples for 40 days. And so let's move on. Let's talk about Shavuot and Pentecost. And so remember what we've got to do. First fruits falls on the day following the weekly Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread here. Here's the, here's the uh, weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is marked with our blue UB here. Weekly Sabbath falls here. We start counting first fruits here. And we start the counting of the Omer here on first fruits. So we know that we count seven Sabbaths, right? Seven weekly Sabbaths from the day of first fruits until we get to the completion of those seven Sabbaths and then the day after, which will be, which will begin on a sundown on a Saturday, seven weeks later from here, first fruits. And then the next day is Shavuot, right? Which we've got here occurs on the day following the completion of seven Sabbaths or seven weeks. It is the 50th day. Pentecost is Greek and it means count 50 from the Feast of First Fruits. Here's the commandment in Leviticus. God says, from the day after the Sabbath, there's the controversy. Is it the first high Sabbath of unleavened bread or is it the day after the weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread? And like I said, we maintain that it's the day after the weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread. From that day, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. It's the first fruits wave offering, first fruits holiday. Count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Shabbat. Then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah of fine flour baked with yeast, which uh, Pastor Gio makes a distinction about that very well. I'll let you teach on that if you want to. Um, this is our wave offering for the first fruits to the Lord. Then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year, a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your feast. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Here's the rehearsal. The very first Shavuot, when God descended in fire on Mount Sinai and began to give the Torah and entered into covenant relationship with Israel is a clear rehearsal in this feast. Another rehearsal, an equally important element, is the two loaf first fruits wave offering made with yeast, which is accompanied by the offering of two lambs. 
Of all the offerings prescribed by God, this particular offering is the only public peace and thanksgiving offering that God commanded Israel to bring. Important to note that. Also, the bread and the flesh of this offering is not given to the offerers, as is the usual custom of making a sacrifice in the temple, but it is reserved for the high priest and the priesthood. Finally, this was the only feast to which the stranger and the alien was invited to to attend. And so let's talk about the fulfillment here of Yeshua. At the Shavuot, following the death and resurrection of Yeshua, tens of thousands of Jews and God-fearing Gentiles had come to Jerusalem for the feast. And you can read that in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 as well as the disciples of Yeshua who were waiting for the gift that the Father promised, which Yeshua had promised them. On the morning of the feast, they were all gathered in the temple courts. Um, They weren't gathered in a secret upper room. They were gathered in the temple courts, along with tens of thousands of other Jewish people and non-Jewish people who were God-fearers who wanted to worship the God of Israel. They were all gathered in the temple courts. God confirmed his new covenant relationship with Israel and all of the non-Jewish people who would choose his son, Yeshua, the promised redeemer of Genesis 3.15, when God gave his spirit in flames of fire to all who accepted Yeshua. Just as the two loaves made with yeast and two lambs were presented as the first fruits, thanksgiving, and, and peace offering, which was reserved for the high priest, so now... Through God's plan of redemption, Jewish and non-Jewish people alike were made acceptable and reserved for God by the atonement accomplished by Yeshua's offering of himself for humanity. So it's interesting to note that the offerings here were not given were, were not given to the priests, or rather to the to the uh, to the offerers to the people. They were reserved for for the high priest and and his family and and the priests. Just as the resurrection of humanity, Jews and non-Jews, are for Yeshua and for God. Let's read about what happened in Acts, in the book of Acts. Here. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Remember, it's not a secret upper room. It's in full display of everybody in the temple courts with tens of thousands of people. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Well, it wasn't a house. If you look, if we could look that up in the original, what was probably Aramaic language, it would have been temple. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them for, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they, we know how the story goes. They spoke in um, foreign languages, right? Because of all the feasts, this was the only one that the non-Jews were specifically invited to attend. And so you had more people coming to this feast from many more uh, foreign nations than any of the other feasts, um, than Passover or uh, Sukkot, because the non-Jews are invited to this one. And so the Jewish people in Egypt or other areas of Mesopotamia would have invited their non-Jewish friends who attended Shabbat with them in their synagogue every week to come to Shavuot, Jerusalem with them, and thousands of them would have come. So you've got a lot of Jews and non-Jews in Jerusalem for this feast. And so you've got a dozen, maybe two dozen nations Foreign nations represented there. And so when the Holy Spirit fell on the people and the disciples, and they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in foreign languages, that's why the book of Acts makes that a big deal, because they are declaring the wonders and the promises of God in the native tongue of all these different nations of people there, so they could understand it, because this is the feast when God had previously planned, I am going to spread my gospel through my disciples to all of these nations at this feast, and I want you to practice it this way for a thousand years prior to it happening so you can understand what's happening when it happens. And so 
that was the fulfillment. How Yeshua and the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 fulfilled that rehearsal that had been going on for at least a thousand years prior. That was a lot. We got five minutes. So, any thoughts, comments, questions? Shalom. Hey, Laura. Hi. I just want to say thank you um, about when you mentioned the promise in Bereshit or Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 15. I never saw it as a promise. I saw it more like a hidden figure about Yeshua. So that was so interesting. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. It's a powerful verse in Genesis 3.15 because it's the very first Messianic verse in the Bible. I mean, it is the foundation of all of the rest of the Messianic verses. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. You know, that's a good point, uh, Mike. And thank you, Laura, for bringing that up because it... I was reading this thing. Um, I'm not going to go into, into the details of what I was reading. I don't want to confuse anyone. Um, but some of the rabbi sages, they say that uh, before God created man, before he created humans, right? And this is all just, it's a way of teaching. It's not factual. But they, they kind of explain creation as, you know, the angels in the heavens, they talked to God and they said, why are you creating man? Man is going to sin and you're going to get mad at man and you're going to punish man. And God said, well, before creating man, I, before created, creating man and creating the world, I created Teshubah. And so what the meaning or the concept behind that is, it's explaining to how God's desire is always for the salvation of humanity which is why Genesis 3.15 from the very beginning is giving us a layout of his love, of what he's always going to, uh, to do for, for his people. And he's establishing a covenant already from the very beginning of bringing the people back to him and restoring all things. Good. Good stuff, my good stuff. Anyone else has any other comments, questions? Well, if nobody's got anything, uh, Gio, what we'll do, uh, I think next week is we'll kind of just do a summary recap of the spring feast, and then we'll talk about getting into the fall feast. And man, there's a question. B, B. Taylor, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, says, so was the giving of the, of the Holy Spirit the fulfillment of Torah? You want to answer that, Mike? Great question. Um, I want to clarify what I think you're asking. Um, it was the fulfillment of the rehearsal of God beginning to give the Torah. I mean, the Torah is not fulfilled. I mean, it's still still an instruction book we still follow it today um it's still valid paul said it was valid i can't remember where he said corinthians somewhere but um so no it was not the fulfillment of torah meaning that torah was not put away after acts chapter 2 um but is the rehearsal of god giving the torah or beginning to give the torah um acts chapter 2 was the fulfillment of that rehearsal element if that makes sense does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. I think it's also probably the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, where he says, I'll put my spirit in you and you will obey. So the two come together mm -hmm. because we, you know, what, what makes a, a human want to obey Torah? It's nothing but the spirit of God himself in us that gives us that desire to do something that goes in complete opposite of the rest of the world, right? Right. Laura has a question. 
Well, more than a question, it's like a comment. I guess that the fulfillment of the Torah will be always Yeshua. So that is like my answer. Good point. Good point. Yeah, because he fulfills everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys got this. Yes, Amen. I feel like All right. Yeshua is the word became flesh. So, yes, Torah becoming flesh is Yeshua. And then Holy Spirit is like you said, uh, the, the um, allowing us to obey the Torah. Right. So the word and the spirit must be together. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and um, just if I can add to that quickly, Gio, um, there's a lot of believers filled with the Spirit that don't have the conviction of following the Torah. So mm -hmm. that's, it's not like we're better, or it's just that we've just walked into um, a different path. Right. Well, the, the truth is, and this is, I think I've shared this with you, Mike. The other day, Mike and I were driving, and I was sharing with Mike that the Lord has given me a theme in my preaching. It's like one topic. Like there's only one message that he wants that the Lord wants me to, to you know, scream out there. And Mike said, And what is it? And I said, Love. Torah is all about love, you know. And at the end of the day, when Yeshua says, you know, love the Lord and then love your neighbor, he's not, he's not excluding all of Torah. He's just saying that Torah leads us to that, to love God and to love our neighbor. It gives us the instructions and the explanations on how we could possibly fulfill that. And so, yeah, you know, there's, there's folks out there that are not keeping the Sabbath, that are not keeping, or maybe they don't, they've never, they don't even know Torah exists. However, the spirit of God in them allows them to love other people more than people that are actually keep in Torah. So, and I think Paul spoke to that, you know, that there's, there's Gentiles that don't have the law yet. They behave better than people that have the law. And so, you know, it's, it's a gift to be able to have this understanding and revelation, but we must not forget what it is for. Yeah. It's for love. Good point, Joe. Great point. And that's it. I mean, Paul said that in, uh, First Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, when he was going through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he said, you know, it doesn't profit you anything to have all the gifts if you don't love. So we've been given the gift of understanding some of this stuff from a Hebraic perspective. And it is a tremendous gift as we get into coming to understand the fall holidays and how their rehearsals for his return on the earth. And then the incredible amount of knowledge that that's going to give us to know what to do and what we don't need to do, um, which we'll understand when we get into it, but it's a gift. And so we take that with, um, it should make us humble to, um, to be love and to be kind to those who, who don't understand the Hebraic context of stuff because um, they're just not there yet. And so it's up to us to in love and in kindness to share and to teach when people are ready. Amen. Amen, brother. Man, good night, guys. It's, I love seeing everybody on here. So I love doing this. And we love you doing it. So awesome, Mike. So next week we continue. Next week Are we you continue. Good? I think what we'll do next week, because we've got some time, we're going to go through um, – those shaded days of gray and gray of when Yeshua appeared to his disciples. And we'll just go over that and talk about that. Um, and we might build back up to Shavuot again because um, we're going to get into the fall feast. And we want to be sure that we've covered all of the fall feasts prior to their occurrence this year in 2022. So that means we've got until September, October sometime to finish. So we've got plenty of time. Um, and we'll take our time because it gets complicated in the fall feast. Because we're going to be talking about the end times. And we're going to be talking about all of the, 
arguments and debates, and we're going to hopefully clarify a lot of those and be able to put about 90% of the different ideas about the end times, um, in my opinion, to the wayside. Because if you pull up an end times website, you can get confused on the multitude of ideas, but I'm going to show you how to put aside about 90% of them. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty, pretty, pretty haughty, but um, it's just how the scriptures work. They just, they just give you insight. Yeah. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, Mike, thank you once again on this. Anybody has any, anything else? We'll close with a prayer. One last chance. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome, Michael. Mike, you're going to be tested on this, okay? Michael Vargas, to see if you were paying attention. Uh, I'm going to get a 90. <laughs> 90 is not going to get you through, man. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> All right, brother Mike, you're good. Let's, you want to close with a prayer, Mike? Yeah, Gio, go ahead. Close this up. Heavenly Father, Father Lord, again. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us this moment. Thank you for choosing us amongst all people. I always say it, Father. It is a privilege. It is a gift to know that you know you know us by our name, that you have redeemed us. And you asked us and you called us not to fear. You're giving us these revelations of your mystery so that we can stay in your path, stay in your covering, in your covenant, stay under your wings father and as the world goes into chaos you protect your people you will protect us from the fire you will protect us from the floods you'll protect us from the the chaos that is to come but you do ask us to maintain one thing and that is to maintain your light shining within us onto the rest of the nations in the manifestation of true love the love that you give us should be something that pours that, that comes out of our pores in an abundant way so that we can always manifest it onto those that are around us. Thank you, Father. And we just simply ask that you continue to give us revelation. Thank you for Mike and his humble spirit and for the talent and gift that you've given him and the understanding. We ask that you continue to protect his life and encourage him not to stop, to continue in this path no matter what it looks like. Thank you once again in your name, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen, Mike. Thank you so much, man. You're welcome. Thank you, Have everyone. Night, guys. Shalom, shalom. shalom. See you next week. Shalom. Shalom. See you next week.